Good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you very much for uh, attending this session. Um, my name is Steve Anderson. I'm an independent television producer. I've worked in television for many years. Uh, most of the of, uh, programs uh, I've uh, managed to damage somewhere along the line. Um, so thanks very much for, for turning up today. Um, we're here to uh, speak to our special guest, Mariana Spring. Um, First of all, just to say, I want this to be a very sort of communal event. So if you have points to make, please put your hands up. You know, if you have points, if you have observations, if you have questions, please put your hands up and uh, we'll try and get the mic to you uh, as quickly as possible so you can contribute. Uh, I think everybody's got views and things to say here which are of, uh, which are of interest to the general audience, so please share them. Um, so Mariana is uh, welcome. Is the BBC's first specialist disinformation and social media reporter, which Bit is a lot mouthful. of words to get into the, li <laughs> the caption, isn't it? Uh, and Mariana investigates the real-life uh, consequences of viral conspiracy theories, falsehoods, and abuse shared on social media. And her journalism appears across the BBC, uh, TV, and radio. She's on the BBC uh, main news programmes, The One, The Six and The Ten, uh, Newsnight, Panorama, uh, Radio 4, Today programme and The World Service. And most recently, Mariana was included in the Forbes 2021 list of 30 under 30 in media and marketing. But given that you're 25, are you in the best, uh, top 25 as well? I know. I, know. <laughs> I have to try and be on it five more times. So we've got we've got some clips and we'll be looking at your work in depth. But first, tell us how you how you got here. Yeah. Um, so, like you say, I um, investigate online conspiracies and disinformation at the BBC. Um, I was one of those slightly weird kids that, age eight, was very fascinated watching BBC World News on holiday <laughs> because it was the only channel in English, um, and I was very curious about everything that was going on. I used to make my poor little sister sit and watch coverage of earthquakes and tsunamis and goodness knows what else to my mum's dismay. Um, and uh, because I became so interested in the news, I guess, when I was younger, I started to get involved in that sorts of stuff when I was at school. So I did a young reporter scheme that we had writing for, uh, that my school had, writing for local papers. You'd do it eight times a year, every month, you'd write a story. And that was a really good way of building up an understanding of how to find a news story, how to talk to people, um, how you can investigate something and find out what's going on, particularly in your local community. Um, I went to university and I studied French and Russian. Um, at uni, I was really involved with the student paper, which was a brilliant experience. It taught me loads about right of replies and uh, legally and editorially how to cover stories because if the newspaper got sued, it wouldn't exist anymore. So it was, it, that was a really um, informative experience. Um, and I think student journalism in general gives you a really good chance to be able to have a go at being a journalist, at editing or reporting or whatever you're interested in, particularly if you have a specialism you like, whether that's um, within news or arts or culture or sport um, and then on my year abroad I uh, was in France and Russia and that gave me an opportunity to do some more journalism. Um, I wrote for the Moscow Times um, which is an English language newspaper when I was in Russia and um, mainly news reporting writing up stories and that gave you, me a really interesting insight as well into how you cover stories in different places the different ways that um, things would be described by the Moscow Times versus how we might do it here in the UK, um, I worked for... Uh, did, did, sorry to interrupt, did the university put you in touch with the Moscow Times? Or did, that's no, so I got in touch with them actually. So I went on my year abroad and thought I'd really like to do some journalism. And one of the reasons that I'd studied languages was because I'd like to use those languages to be able to do some reporting. Um, and so I got in touch with the Moscow Times. I emailed a number of the editors. Um, I think I reached out to a couple of them on Twitter and one of them got back to me and said, oh, actually, we often do work with students if you'd be interested in doing some news reporting. Um, and I did it from my bedroom in Yaroslavl, which is a town which nobody here has probably heard of, um, which, was, which was where I was living. Um, and it was a great opportunity to understand how a newsroom works um, and to have a go at writing um, some short articles. Um, and I tried to do the same thing when I went to France. So I got in touch with The Local, which is a news site that exists in different European countries. Um, and that was brilliant because I had the opportunity to uh, go out and about, and I was based in Paris, and cover protests and floods and 
um, you know, really be on the ground. I got tear gassed, which was not particularly fun. <laughs> Again, gave me quite a lot of insight into what it's like being on the ground, covering this stuff, working with an editor. Um, and I worked at a local newspaper in France, again, just by emailing the paper and asking if they ever have the opportunity for experience. Um, particularly when you're on your year abroad, there are certain bursaries that were available to students who were studying, but also you know, doing internships or work experience. And, and that was really useful. So you came, you did your year in Moscow and you, and you worked in France as well, and you came back and resumed your university yes. and carried on working for the student paper then? Yeah, exactly. Um, and it was then that I started applying for work experience. Um, and I'm sure everyone here has kind of been through that process of applying for different stuff on um, either newspaper or broadcast media websites. Um, I applied for some work experience at The Guardian um, and at Private Eye as well. Um, and I had the opportunity to do a couple of weeks with, with both of them. Um, and that, that was brilliant, again, because I was able to see how a really big newsroom works in the case of The Guardian um, and to see how Private Eye, which works slightly differently, you know, covers news and investigations and satire. Um, and and that, was, that was great um, and I learned a lot. And uh, I kept going back to The Guardian doing shifts during my time, again, because I kept in touch with a lot of the reporters I'd met when I was on their news desk. And I think it's often about learning and asking questions and, and wanting to understand how to do stuff. And one thing I've loved about journalism is how many people really want to help um, young people who are getting into the industry and, and who are interested and curious. So getting, but getting into The Guardian clearly is a, is, a big, is a big step forward. How did you, was that just nagging your way in or did you know somebody or? It was just applying through, they had a, they had a website, um, I, I, it's probably changed now, but they had a, a work experience application that you could apply for and I, I submitted an application. I, I'm pretty sure I submitted kind of work experience applications to quite a few publications um, and I didn't get all of them obviously, um, but The Guardian were one of the places that replied. Um, it was useful being able to speak languages as well, so I did a, a bit of reporting about Russia and they were interested. I covered um, some domestic violence and sexual harassment stories about Russia and um, I think sometimes having having a certain expertise, in this case languages, was, was really helpful to me because I could offer them something that perhaps um, other applicants uh, didn't speak Russian, so that was useful. So you applied for the BBC Graduate Training Scheme, is that right? Which, I did. Which I know is very, very uh, competitive. What happened when you applied to that? I didn't get, I didn't get an interview. Um, I didn't get any further than just applying. Um, and I remember being really disheartened and thinking, oh, I'd love to work for the BBC. and. Um, feeling really disappointed, I think because I didn't really know how else you could get into journalism other than through the trainee schemes. I didn't get onto any trainee schemes. I applied for all of them and I spoke about the experience I had from being at university and from uh, other work experience I'd done. Um, and I remember thinking, oh, that I, I don't know how I'm going to do this. And I was doing shifts at The Guardian when I finished, which was a great experience. Um, and there was a wonderful reporter I worked with there called Lexi Topping. And she said to me, well, why don't you have a go at just emailing some of the people that you really like who work at the BBC? Um, and so I shot off a few dozen emails to some of the presenters and reporters I liked, thinking that no one would reply to me, but it was worth a shot. Um, and I remember one day opening my email inbox and seeing that Emily Maitlis had replied. And I thought, oh my God, that's amazing, because I, I think she's great. Um, and she said to me, oh, I, I really like that. I'd sent over some links to reporting I'd done, and I just asked if she'd ever be willing to meet me for a chat or if there's any way of applying for you know, work experience or placements at Newsnight. Um, and she said, oh, why don't you speak to our deputy editor? And, you know, we do offer shifts, we do freelance shifts and um, see what he says. Um, and so I met with him um, and I learned the journalism art of when you meet someone important for a coffee, it's actually an interview, not just a coffee. Um, and uh, and he, he was brilliant and suggested I come in and have a go at a trial shift. And it started from there, really. I was on the desk, so I was booking guests and briefing presenters, um, one of them being Emily Maitlis. Uh, and it, it was a brilliant experience. I, I learned I learned loads. I mean, it takes it takes a lot of front and a lot of chutzpah, you know, to write to someone like Emily make this uh, and then go and you know, and she responds to you, talk to her like she's a mate. I mean, do you think <laughs> do you think the uh, do you think the experience you'd already got under your belt had, uh, came in handy there? I think it was helpful having been in newsrooms and understood a little bit more about how it worked from work experience. Um, having 
Um, the report at The Guardian, who was really helpful to me and, and mentored me in that way, was really useful as well, because having someone encourage you and say, well, you know, it's a really good idea to be brave, put yourself out there, take a risk. You know, if you're asking questions and you're polite and you want to be there, no one's ever going to be sort of offended or put off or, you know, don't worry about being annoying, basically. And, and that was a really helpful lesson and that being persistent is a really positive thing and that you should keep trying. Um, it was useful to be able to share reporting I'd done. And I think that's why whenever people get in touch with me, I always really encourage encourage them to, you know, whether it's student journalism or pitching their ideas, to have stuff that they can show, to show the kinds of journalism they're interested in or that they like doing or that they're capable of doing. Because I think that counts for a lot when you're, you know, emailing editors or people who are actually able to read or watch what you've been up to, even if it's just a YouTube channel or your social media or, or something you've been doing. And what was it, what was it about journalism? Do you think it was just something that it was just there, it was just within you, that, that this, this is what you had to pursue? I think I very much, I love talking, as you, as you know quite well. <laughs> um, I love talking. Um, I really like investigating things and exploring them and looking into them. Um, I think I'm quite a curious person in that way. Um, and so it really appealed to me in that sense, the idea of being able to expose and to inform and to communicate with people, to engage with them, to understand. Um, uh, and that in part is, is what you know, mainly inspired me really. And I thought, oh, how wonderful would it be to be able to go in every day and to investigate stuff and cover stuff and talk to people. That's, that, I can't, you know, it doesn't feel like doing a job really because it is really exciting. And even when you're absolutely knackered, sitting and edit, you know, editing something really late, you think, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm really happy to be here. I love doing this. And the whole question of being a digital native, I mean, coming in at this time, just when there's this huge explosion, we, we've been saying this for a few years, a huge explosion, but the explosion just seems to be getting bigger all the time. I mean, was it was it disinformation? Was it conspiracy theories? Was that something that was you were fascinated by anyway, or is that just is that just been a happy accident? I was really interested in social media investigations in general. I really liked kind of looking into Facebook groups and. Um, joining different spaces online and, and seeing what was going on. And when I was at Newsnight, I started working on um, some investigations. And one of them was around the European election, looking at Facebook groups and trying to you know, track how disinformation and fake news was spreading. Um, it just so happened that when I started at the BBC, it was you know, not long after the 2016 election, there'd been lots of discussion about foreign influence. Having studied Russian again was helpful because um, uh, there was a lot of there, there was a lot of discussion about Russia. Um, and so I, I knew that I was interested in that already. Um, but I think as well, it helps, you know, like you say, kind of being a digital native, knowing it's a topic that I get and I could use my skills to investigate what was happening in Facebook groups or come up with ideas about how, how to cover these topics was helpful. And when it came around to the 2019 election, I started covering, I did social media investigations with BBC Trending, which is ultimately how I sort of ended up in my current job. Um, and again, you know, being able to track how one bit of fake news spreads or to understand the impact that a local Facebook group can have on an entire community when it comes to voting in an election. Um, I loved doing that and it was something that the audience, um, whether it was viewers or listeners or readers, really engaged with. Um, a really good bit of advice I think I had early on from a couple of the reporters I worked with at Newsnight um, was actually it can be really beneficial to specialise um, when you're younger. So to find something that you're really interested in that you think you can add value in, that you know that you can investigate or look into and to really run at it. Um, it's good to have general skills. You know, it was brilliant to be able to you know, do a bit of telly and a bit of radio and, and understand how all that works and all the terms that I'd never heard of. I didn't know what an Aston was. I'm just, I don't know if anyone here <laughs> does. I'm very impressed if you do already, because I didn't. Um, and so I think, it's, I think it is really good to find something that you care about and that you can offer in a way that perhaps, you know, doesn't exist at that time. I think the BBC was getting to grips with social media investigations at the time when I was also interested in it. And in many ways, that was kind of fortune that both of those things happened at the same time. But moving from print into broadcast is a big step in itself. I mean, it's a totally different world, really. Completely, and all the words and all the terms and how it works. I mean, even understanding the relationship between producers, reporters, editors um, is really different. And I think when it comes to getting experience, print can often be easier because it's, you know, you can pitch and just an individual article and you can write, you know how to do that, you have Word or Google Docs or whatever else you need to be able to have a go at that. Um, whereas getting into broadcast is, is perhaps more difficult in that way. Um, but essentially, and something that always really uh, made me really happy was that 
the skills are the same, you know, being a journalist, being able to investigate a story, speak to people, understand, you know, what's the top line, what do we want to say here? Um, that translates really well, and it's just about then acquiring the skills that allow you to deliver that in tele form or radio form or online as well in the case of the BBC. But I do remember turning up at Newsnight and thinking, don't know what don't know what an Aston is, don't know what, I said, oh, uh, can someone take me down to the room with all the tellies at the bottom, which was the gallery, but I didn't know it was called the gallery. <laughs> <laughs> and they thought, who is this? <laughs> and what about the actual act of broadcasting itself? I mean, did you go through any, did anybody sort of tell you guys or did you just sort of t uh, told to get on with it? Uh, probably a combination of the two things. Uh, the first live I ever did uh, was on The World at One on Radio 4 um, and it was about a, a report I'd done to do with uh, death threats in Facebook groups and lots of MPs were being threatened sort of ahead of the 2019 election um, and I'd investigated how that was being used um, and I remember I remember kind of having my notes and one of the best bits of advice I had was you know have three things you really want to say and know what you want to say and say them um, don't try and say too much don't try and don't 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 ha not have something prepared um, but also I think when it's your own reporting and you've done it you get it and the worst thing ever is being asked about something that you don't know anything about and if you can avoid that at all costs you're on pretty safe footing mm -hmm. I mean there's there is that there is I found, and I think I've heard from lots of other people who did the same as me, moving from newspapers into the world of broadcast. There is a, <clears throat> there is a big, what you have to come to terms with is that loss of control that you, on, on newspapers or in print, you're essentially in, ch in charge of your own story. Whereas television, particularly, is a much more, is, a, is a much more team effort, isn't it? You've got camera operators, you've got picture editors. You've got a whole team of producers that you work with as well. Yeah. How did you find that uh, adapting from one to the other? Yeah, I think I think that is a big change. And, you know, you're used to, when you're at a newspaper, you know, loads of the people who work there are reporters. Whereas when you get into telly, there are fewer reporters and there's much, there's, you're right, it's much more collaborative in that way. But I think that comes with it. You know, that brings with it great opportunity. I mean, I found particularly, you know, working with Panorama, say I worked with you, um, I've just done a Panorama about online hate. And you work with a brilliant team who've got a range of different skills that are hugely beneficial, whether it's, you know, executive producers and editors who are able to really give a kind of clear steer on the direction of the investigation or the film, um, producers who are able to, you know, really be across your interviews and say, oh, why don't you ask that as well? And to encourage you in that way, even the most recent Panorama I did, we set up a, a fake uh, troll called Barry uh, to test the social media algorithms to see whether troll accounts have promoted hate by uh, social media. We found that Facebook and Instagram did promote anti-women hate, although they say they commit to not doing that. Um, and one thing that uh, was brilliant was uh, one of the assistant producers who was great, uh, had a great understanding of you know, how to set up a remote computer so we could make sure our account wasn't being interfered with by anything else we were doing, all of the kind of safety procedures that come with that. It was very much a, a collaboration. And I think that allows you to do really impactful programs or investigations or reports for telly that you wouldn't necessarily have the resources to do in print. And, and that's, again, a, a really good thing and to communicate in a different way and I think that allows you to reach more people um, whether it's you know you repackage something for podcasts and you do it for Panorama and you do it for the six o'clock news and you have it for online it means that you are getting to uh, uh, people who consume the news in different ways and I think that's that's vital. Okay we're going to have a look at uh, a clip about fake news one of the stories that you did for Newsnight um, it's a Newsnight investigation into Woolworths that, that never was. <laughs> um, just talk us, just, just just give us people a background and then we can run the clip. Uh, so um, people may or may not remember there was a time when um, it went really viral on Twitter that Woolworths was reopening. It was about this time last year um, because there was a Twitter account that had popped up and everyone got very overexcited and thought, oh yes, the pandemic's been really rubbish and now Woolworths is going to open. Um, and it was covered by a lot of newspapers. It was widely picked up. A lot of celebrities were sharing it. And then we all suddenly realised, oh, Woolworths is spelt wrong on the Twitter account. And where has this account actually come from? And so I did this film for Newsnight, which was understanding the anatomy essentially of how fake news spreads um, you know and and in this case this kind of fake news might not seem that harmful I mean we've been seeing falsehoods about the pandemic about vaccines um, about elections that can have real world harm when you when it's Woolworths it you know why does it matter but actually what it teaches us is how quickly we react to something that's really emotive and mm -hmm. how this stuff spreads 
Okay, well, let's have a look at it now. The latest, greatest, ever more spectacular Woolworth Christmas Show! Christmas is around the corner, and we're all a bit nostalgic for those good old days before the pandemic. So, when a viral announcement on Twitter said that Woolworths was reopening, it was hailed as the news that could save festivities in 2020. Stupendous and amazing value in toys, I'll tell you. On social media, people rejoiced, fondly remembering Pick and Mix and their favourite Woolies treats, and it was splashed across news sites. Only, the viral tweet announcing the relaunch of the UK High Street retailer, which closed its doors back in 2008, was fake. Very, the company that owns the Woolworth brand, confirmed that the relaunch is not happening and that the Twitter account is not real. Fake news about Woolworth's reopening might seem less important than harmful coronavirus conspiracy theories and political disinformation, but actually it reveals a lot about how falsehoods spread and how we can all be susceptible to them. I think this disinformation incident shows us the two really important factors that influence whether people believe false information or not. So one is whether it can grab your attention, and it certainly did that in this instance. But the other is, does it really appeal to your emotions? And we've seen this wave of nostalgia around the Woolworths disinformation tweet that shows that if fake news is able to capture people's emotions, it can be a really powerful driver um, towards misleading information. The original tweet came from an account called at UK Woolworths, which had more than 4,000 followers before it was suspended. It was a new account and not verified by Twitter like most well-known businesses. It linked to a website that was not active and had only been registered hours earlier. Not just that, but it even misspelled the shop's name. In a series of tweets, it claimed Woolworths was here to save the year and that trial stores will open in 2021. Nostalgic social media users shared the hashtag Your Woolworths with their favourite memories of Woolies. And before long, a horde of newspapers and news outlets had written up the story. Woolworths set to return, reported the Metro. Woolworths will open three trial stores, said the Mail. Woolworths set to return to the high streets, wrote the Daily Star. All three news sites later updated their stories. This also highlights the way bad information can be boosted by both social media and by media outlets. If journalists had done the most basic checks, they would never have run the story. Online disinformation spreads fast. But to truly get mainstream, it needs help from politicians, celebrities and media outlets. Newsnight contacted the account in question. Whoever's behind it didn't respond. It may have just been a prank. But it raises a worrying question. If a fake news story about Woolworths can go viral, how easy is it for more harmful falsehoods to spread online like wildfire? So what was the moral of the story there, do you think? Uh, the moral of the story was that, uh, from a, for the audience, that online disinformation spreads really, really quickly, particularly when it makes you feel something. And if we're all aware of that, then perhaps that can stop it doing as much harm as it can. Um, the, the account actually, uh, as was revealed after we'd done the Newsnight film, was created by a 17-year-old um, who wanted to test how much um, brand recognition counts and how people who are nostalgic for something will share it online. And he very much proved his <laughs> case and did a very good job of it. And how uh, did you investigate it? Sort of take us through step by step. Um, so at first it was you know trying to verify the account, going through the various things I mentioned there, looking at the spelling, looking when the account had been set up. Why wasn't it verified? Why didn't it have very many followers? Where had this come from? Um, the website that was linked to it that didn't, again, look to be particularly official. There was no statement that had been um, that had been released. Um, so, you know, firstly verifying the account itself and then looking at how it had spread. So using things like CrowdTangle, which people may or may not have heard of. It's a great program that is linked to um, it's linked to Facebook and you can use it to um, you know, track how one post has spread and where it's gone. And that was really useful. And then obviously messaging the account itself. Um, and unfortunately, I didn't hear back from the person running it until after the film. But that gave me the answer I needed about why it had happened. OK, we've got a question there. Yes. Um, hi, Mariana. It's, it's a really interesting talk you're giving. Um, I, I really enjoyed your, your uh, package that we just watched from Newsnight there. 
And I completely agree with what you're saying that um, fake news does often require uh, the backing of celebrities or media organisations. Um, as someone who works for the BBC, the BBC has faced itself accusations of peddling fake news, especially, uh, for example, Newsnight um, putting a, a picture of Jeremy Corbyn in a Russian hat on a Russian backdrop to connote ideas of um, you know, somebody who is against the interests of, of uh, Britain. And in the 2019 election, so um, at the start of the campaign, um, BBC Breakfast playing a, a clip uh, of Boris Johnson laying a wreath from previous years to disguise the fact that he'd put it upside down. Um, or later in the campaign, editing out laughter uh, at Boris Johnson's expense during a debate. Or Laura Koonsberg uh, repeating okay. unfounded claims. Could you just get the question, please? Yes, sorry. My, <laughs> my question is, um, do you think that the BBC... Uh, has work to do in terms of its own output and in tackling fake news from its own ranks? Um, I mean, obviously, I'm not the Director General, uh, so <laughs> um, I'm answering kind of in my capacity as a reporter at the BBC. Um, and a lot of the things you mentioned actually happened before my job existed. Um, I work with the top team at the BBC um, across BBC Monitoring, BBC Trending and Reality Check, whose job it is to investigate the real world impact of online disinformation, conspiracy theories, how they affect people. Um, and uh, it's really important that mistakes aren't made and that reporting is accurate and that um, uh, and that people properly you know across the board um, you're right that it's really important that the, the media itself doesn't play a role in spreading and perpetuating disinformation I mean I talk in in my capacity that we've got of all the UK broadcasters and um, one of the most advanced teams in terms of covering this beat it's something that the US um, started doing in 2016 and um, NBC New York Times BuzzFeed have all got great kind of dedicated correspondence um, following following the election there um, but you know we are I hope kind of at the forefront of covering this um, and I can only really talk in my capacity as, as covering it myself um, but we've done a lot of different reporting I mean at the moment we've got a whole series called the denial files which is going out on BBC sounds about climate disinformation whether it's covid conspiracies or online abuse you know we cover a range of different topics um, and yeah I hope that kind of answers your question just on on the whole question of fake news that, and now now you you're it's your speciality now. I mean, how prevalent would you say it is? Is it, is it, does it surprise you that there's more or do you think that there's less than we, we think there is? Um, I think during the pandemic, it's been particularly, um, you know, obviously it's been a really fertile time for conspiracies and disinformation to spread. A lot of people have been, um, you know, it's been a really difficult time. People are looking for answers. Um, a lot of people are quite frightened, quite anxious, and you see how falsehoods can really um, spread online. The real worry and what I spend a lot of my time reporting on is the human cost of that, whether it's vaccines or pandemic disinformation or violence that's inspired by political disinformation as we saw at, at Capitol Hill. Um, I think what's key is that there are a small minority of people who are really impacted by this stuff, but they are often, you know, in effect almost radicalized they are they are truly kind of um brought into these kinds of quite extreme online um, movements and, and ideologies and that often results in real world harm whether it's um protests that lead to violence here in the uk we've seen a lot of people calling for you know doctors and nurses to be tried or hanged um, and so i think while the vast majority of people probably aren't always impacted by disinformation in a way that causes harm those that are have come to real harm and, and that's a big problem well, let's spin to an event which did have a lot of dis disinformation around it, which was the, the US elections uh, of last year. Just talk us through, the, uh, in the august company of Andrew Neil and Cathy Kay, just, just talk us through very briefly before we go into the clip what your role was on this programme. So I was there to offer um uh, analysis as a specialist reporter who covers online disinformation. There'd been a lot of talk about QAnon, which people might or may not have heard of, um, which is a conspiracy movement that believed that Donald Trump um, was uh, waging a secret war against satanic paedophiles in government, media and, and uh, uh, business. And um, I was there to talk about um, uh, what I was seeing on social media and the impact that those conspiracy theories might or might not be having. OK, let's run the clip, please. Now we're going to speak to the BBC's disinformation correspondent. Now, I know some of you thought that was me, uh, but it's not. Uh, in fact, the full title is the BBC's disinformation and social media correspondent. Uh, she's Mariana Spring. She's in the BBC uh, newsroom. Uh, Mariana, we know there's been a lot of disinformation around 
social media is full of it. Has it played a big role in this 2020 election campaign? We've definitely seen a lot of conspiracy theories being shared online in the build-up to this election. Uh, that's everything from conspiracy theories suggesting Donald Trump didn't really have coronavirus, promoted by Democrat supporters, to this QAnon conspiracy theory. It's a baseless conspiracy that suggests President Trump is waging a secret war against satanic paedophiles, and in fact, the first person ever has been elected to Congress who supports that QAnon conspiracy theory. Uh, she, she's in Georgia and has just been, has just been elected. Um, and then we've also seen a great deal of voting disinformation, uh, falsehoods about um, falsehoods about whether postal voting uh, will be fraudulent. Um, and that's not just in the build-up to the election, but today we've seen all kinds of uh, unsubstantiated rumours about fraud, about suggestions that people were being intimidated at polling stations. And that's something people should be really looking out for on their social media feeds. And in the hours to come, the concern is that allegations of voter fraud or suggestions that one camp might announce they've won on social media or or something like that could happen and that's what we and all of the social media sites are keeping an eye on anything floating around tonight any i'm, I'm intrigued by the idea that uh, someone's actually been elected to the u.s congress uh, believing the uh, QAnon conspiracy but any any new conspiracies floated tonight that we can get to grips with or signs of russian or chinese interference Actually, surprisingly not. Aside from voting disinformation, we haven't seen any new conspiracy theories emerge. But one thing that has become clear is that a lot of the disinformation in the build-up to polling day has come from domestic sources. It appears to have originated in the US. And so the foreign interference that we've been analysing actually seems to have just co-opted or capitalised on that really polarised conversation already happening online. So we can expect in the weeks after this election, we might realise that there were people in Russia or in Iran or in China spreading voting disinformation and amplifying that on social media. But right now, we don't have that answer. And Mariana, today the FBI and the New York Attorney General announced that they are investigating a spate of robocalls around the country that are telling people to stay home, not go out and vote, telling them that it wasn't safe. What have you heard about that? And is this more of the domestic interference? I guess it just doesn't always take the form of something on Facebook, right? Exactly. I think that's a really important point. And actually, that's a way of targeting voters who don't use social media with disinformation. There were reports across the US of people receiving calls that said, stay home, stay safe, don't go out and vote, uh, you can vote tomorrow, all of which are unhelpful and untrue. And a lot of officials were very concerned about the impact that could have. It's currently unclear where that's come from. And actually, there were reports of similar calls in other countries in the build-up to this. So it's really unclear who's doing this. Uh, it could be foreign actors, it could be domestic and it's happened at a very late hour so it makes you question why would you do this and has it really had any impact but it has been widespread nonetheless so this specialism that you have does allow you actually to be a commentator as well as being a journalist doesn't it to talk us through the sort of difference that you see in those two roles yeah, so um, a lot of, I guess, the, the commentary that I offer is often based on my reporting. So in this case, um, it was that I'd spent, you know, the build-up to the election investigating the QAnon conspiracy, the impact that it was had, having. I'd done several reports um, interviewing people who um, had been put off voting because they believed this conspiracy or it had changed how they were going to vote or they had friends who weren't going to vote as a consequence. Um, uh, and I think particularly around the US election, that specialism... I mean, so straight after that, which was at, it was, I think it was at half two in the morning, um, we then had Trump come out and say the election had been stolen and there was a total proliferation of disinformation about voting um, and a number of Facebook groups that sprung up called Stop the Steal. I did some reports in the days after the election about that. In those Facebook groups, there was discussion of riots, of civil war and of uh, rioting at the Capitol, which is something we saw happen on the 6th of January. So I think in many ways, that role of being a specialist reporter, investigating stories and commenting on them also gives you some sense of what's going to happen next. And um, when we saw the scenes at Capitol Hill in January, I really wasn't very surprised. I'd interviewed a number of people who genuinely believed a lot of the disinformation spreading about the election, that it was rigged. Um, they'd seen false videos of ballots being burned and stuff like that. And QAnon and conspiracies had laid the groundwork for this because they'd made people believe that the entire system was rigged and of course this was going to happen. Um, so I think that having a specialism in that way is really useful, not only because you can really get into something, investigate it, you can do lives as well as reports and investigations, um, 
But um, uh, at the same time, it gives you some foresight as well. You're able to say, oh, you know, what's going to happen next? Where should we turn? What should we be looking at? And, you know, Capitol Hill was the next thing on, on this sort of timeline. But what do you say to those people who say, but you're, you're still in your early 20s. I mean, why should I believe what you're saying about this? You, you don't know enough yet. That is one of the favourite themes of people that send me abuse, um, often that I'm a silly little girl and I don't know what I'm talking about, um, and how can I, because I'm only 25. Um, and uh, my response to that would be that um, I think particularly when it comes to a specialism like the one I have, which is social media investigations, it's something that you grow and evolve and you learn lots. But also I think for me and probably you know, almost all of the people here now, social media has been a part of our life growing up. You're a native of it. And actually investigating it, understanding it, it's intuitive. You're really used to it. And that's something that you can bring to the table rather than being a downside. You're also younger and you connect with audiences in a different way. And that's a positive thing. Um, so I think always when you're young, there's loads you can learn. Um, and I love doing everything I do at the BBC now because I continue to learn loads and I definitely don't know everything. Um, but I think when you develop a specialism, you know, that's a process that you're, you're executing in real time, really. And even watching back some of these reports, it's really funny because they're a year ago and you think, oh, how much have I learned since I mm. was covering that or reporting on that? Of course, the, the dark side of the web, which is a phrase that, you know, we begin to hear more and more of that. You were looking into that a lot for that election, weren't you? Tell us, tell us what you tell us what you found, what it is and what you found out about it. I spent a lot of time, particularly in um, Facebook groups or Telegram channels. People here might, might use Telegram. It's a bit like a WhatsApp, Facebook fusion um, <laughs> uh, that's really into privacy. Um, and uh, you, you see a lot of uh, conspiracies, disinformation, abuse around the US election. A lot of that was, like I said, the QAnon conspiracy or voting disinformation around the pandemic. A lot of that has been anti-vaccine conspiracies that are worlds apart from legitimate debate. Um, uh, and concerns and questions, often in fact exploiting those legitimate concerns. Um, uh, online abuse as well, you see littering these kinds of groups and pages, sometimes coming from conspiracy activists, calls for people to be executed and hanged. Um, we've noticed a real increase recently in that violent rhetoric, which is quite worrying. It's something that's directed at me, but it's also directed at a number of doctors, journalists, politicians who get in touch with me. Um, and I think the thing that's most striking about my job, or perhaps the bit that uh, maybe like is the wrong word, but I think that's the most important, is being able to speak to the people who are impacted and to put a human face on this, because talking about the kind of dark side of the web feels like this abstract other, that there's something kind of murky going on, but it doesn't really affect us, you know, it affects someone else. And actually being able to speak to people whose relationships have broken down or who've been affected by violence or whose lives have been, uh, lives have been ruined or they've been put off the vaccine or they've you know, been put off using social media because of online hate. That's really important so that people can realise that social media is now part of the fabric of our real lives. And this isn't just some kind of geeky, quirky specialism. It's one that actually affects all of us. Uh, at the start of this year, uh, I got a phone call from uh, the editor of Panorama asking me if I could be the executive producer of a programme which was underway, uh, which was being uh, reported by the BBC's disinf specialist disinformation reporter. Uh, a person I didn't even know existed. Um, that brought Mariana and I together on, a, on an investigation that she was working on into uh, a group of uh, doctors, international doctors uh, and others, who were trying to stop people uh, getting vaccinated against COVID-19. Um, this led to a programme that went out on Panorama uh, in February this year. Uh, and we're just going to play a clip of it now. Back to our experiment. The injection of toxins and eight people with a range of concerns about the vaccine who agreed to watch the video that's causing so much alarm. I believe that COVID-19 exists absolutely not. Has it put any of our volunteers off? Having watched that video, where are you now in your thinking? It was like a, a propaganda video. It's totally inappropriate for somebody who might be easily influenced. But half said the video had raised more queries for them about the vaccine. We asked epidemiologist Professor Liam Smeeth, who was monitoring the experiment, to answer any of the group's questions. It was stated in the video that animal trials had been skipped. Mm. Is that true? No, it's definitely not true. 
And I've seen the data from the animal trials and then the normal animal trials were done. There's a lot of specialists, as it were, saying that it's not safe um, and it'll affect your fertility. There's nothing in any kind of mechanisms or biology to think how these vaccines would influence fertility. The other thing is, you know, the question about whether it affects your DNA. I can guarantee this vaccine doesn't affect your DNA. Now they know more of the facts, are they reassured? Yes, I will have the vaccine. <laughs> <laughs> I will take it, even though I have some hesitation, I will. And so I'm quite pleased that we talked. Good, I'm glad to hear it. I feel very slightly more reassured, but I do still feel a little bit like I, I still am query and question about the long-term effects of it. If anything, I'm more inclined to take the vaccine because seeing these anti-vaxxers being so dramatic, oh, the virus doesn't exist, it's all conspiracy sort of thing, I just, it, it pushes me to be more inclined to believe the pro-vaxxers. A little bit of caution is understandable, but uh, I think you could be reasonably reassured that the benefits definitely outweigh the risks. After talking to Professor Smeeth, all those who took part in the experiment felt more confident about the vaccine. He believes any doctor or professional promoting false claims should face disciplinary action. I would certainly be very pro them being investigated and uh, the evidence of harm being looked at properly and then stop from doing that and stop from using their title and stop from doing that to individual patients. What, what struck me about first meeting you when we were making that programme was that you were getting a lot of people actually coming to you online. Um, I mean, normally when, pe when journalists and producers are making television programmes, we have to go out and find the people. What astonished me was that you already uh, have a sort of reputation whereby people are coming to you with information. Tell me about that. Yeah, it's one of the bits that, again, I sort of really like about my job, but I've developed a, a rapport with the audience that means that they often reach out to me. Um, two of the people we interviewed for that panorama, um, Ro Rosemary and Donald, who are in their 80s, who lived in Norwich, had emailed me because they'd seen that video and it had worried them so much they weren't sure they wanted to get the vaccine anymore. Um, and it feels like a really important um, you know, public service to be able to reply to people and to, to help and investigate their stories and to understand. And so much of my reporting actually comes from people getting in touch with me and telling me, oh, my relatives fall in really deep into these online conspiracies. Could you could you help me? Or, um, you know, I've been scared of having the vaccine by this video. Could you investigate it? Um, and I think that is in many ways kind of part of the evolution, I guess, of the role of the journalist in the age of social media, that, that you are able to have a conversation with people and that they can get in touch with you on Twitter or they can email you or they can send you a message on Instagram um, and you have a relationship with them. And I think it's so important to be able to bring the audience with you, whether that's just by showing the anatomy of how fake news spreads in the case of the Woolworths film, for example, or actually being able to investigate something that they're seeing that's impacting them. And I think that's, yeah, I think that's just a really crucial part of my job. I sometimes joke I'm a bit like a conspiracy theory acne mm -hmm. aunt. <laughs> now, what, was, what would you say was the big difference between making a half hour you know, long form journalism panorama compared to doing two minutes on the six o'clock news? It's just such a, a process, I think, um, a, a brilliant process that I loved uh, doing and really like, yeah, it was really exciting. But also, you know, the number of people involved, like you were saying, you have an executive producer and you have a producer director, you have other producers who get involved. Um, you really fact check and test the journalism. That's really important. You do the same on the six and 10 o'clock news, but when it's only two minutes, <laughs> there's much less to test. Um, you work with a range of different people with different skill sets, whether that's the picture editors who, or the, the editors in the suites who will cut a beautiful half an hour film, um, or whether it's the uh, production team who will organise all of the interviews. Um, and so I think understanding how TV news is such a collaborative effort is really important and how vital, particularly when it comes to investigations, having brilliant editors and producers and assistant producers who work with you is totally crucial to be able to, be able to make this stuff come to life on air. And there's a lot of long nights. <laughs> a lot of long nights. You should have seen the last one. I think there were more long nights than when we were doing it. <laughs> yeah, one, of, one of the clips there, we, we saw a woman called Kate Shemarami, um, the doctor who was saying that she thought COVID-19 was, was false. Um, now, you interviewed her for, the, for that programme. Um, now, you fundamentally disagree with what she's saying. So how do you approach somebody like that, who you are 180 degrees polar opposite from, uh, you see as sort of quite a malign force uh, because she's using a lot of scare tactics. 
Um, how, do you, how do you approach her in a sort of uh, a, a spirit of let's work together and, carry, and, and win her over to do an interview with you? I think the most important thing I've found, particularly when interviewing kind of conspiracy and anti-vaccine influencers or even you know, trolls and people sending abuse, is to come at it from a point of empathy because you want to understand the purpose of interviewing them is to understand why this is happening and what they're doing in the first instance. And then you want to hold them accountable for for that harm. But I think starting by trying to understand and then putting to them that opposition and saying, well, you know, lots of people would disagree with you, actually. You know, this is contrary to scientific evidence. What do you think? I think it's often effective because you do need to you do need to empathise and understand. And I find that the most productive interviews I have with people aren't the kind of shouting matches where you're saying, you're wrong and this isn't right. It's actually, you know, letting the conversation happen and listening and trying to get why that's happened. Um, and I think that, you know, the same applies for when you're interviewing the victims of this stuff, the people impacted. You really want to, to, to understand what's happened to them and see how they've been affected. It's the same for understanding, you know, how these conspiracy influencers have come to be and then you hold them accountable for why are they doing this is it the political influence is it the money um i found in the most recent panorama i did um i interviewed someone sending me abuse uh, a guy called steve um he doesn't send me some of the worst abuse and i think that's probably why he was willing to speak to me um and i really wanted to understand why he did it and we actually had you know quite a productive conversation and i think the thing i really took from it was it's people like him who are also falling victim to this stuff you know he'd been swept up in a lot of really extreme online conspiracies he thought it was normal basically to send people abuse regularly whether it's me or other women online um, or other people online in general and I think being able to understand that is valuable because whether you're a viewer or a listener or a reader you want to get what's going on and that's our job as journalists to explain that to people just back on that program uh, balance and impartiality are clearly big uh, uh, points of uh, interest at the BBC at any time but particularly at the moment um, we were we were pretty pro having the vaccine there, weren't we? I mean, yet there's a huge constituency out there which says the vaccines are, are evil and they're... So where was, what, 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 what's our attitude there, do you think, on balance and impartiality on a, on a subject like that? I think it all comes down to the due impartiality bit of the BBC, which is actually that being impartial doesn't mean giving both sides equal airtime. Being impartial means covering something fairly and accurately. And in the case of the anti-vaccine movement or um, online conspiracies in general, there are often legitimate concerns and questions. In fact, the panel that we interviewed as part of that experiment expressed a lot of those very normal kind of concerns that they had, the hesitancy they had. Hesitancy is the Yeah, hesitancy is the word. Whereas yeah. the worry was, and what we saw with that video, is that it was exploiting that hesit hesitancy with false claims, claims that were contrary to science, the idea that COVID doesn't exist, or the idea that the vaccine is going to change your DNA, which an overwhelming body of evidence suggests isn't true. And it wouldn't be fair to give those two viewpoints, you know, the same, the same, uh, the same airtime, um, because one is wrong uh, and one is right. And I think with my job, um, you know, a lot of it is investigating the harm caused by stuff that's false or online abuse, which we know is kind of unequivocally wrong. You shouldn't be telling someone you want to behead them or kill them or rape them. Um, and so it's about, you know, it, it's not just about the question of, uh, of balance, it's about you know what's accurate and what's true and what's fair. There's the challenge there, I think, in that program. We were, that, that video that we were sort of putting on screen was a 40-minute video with, featuring sort of 30 odd doctors from around the world, all peddling the same uh, message that the vaccine is de the vaccines are dangerous. Um, yet, knowing full well that the more you showed of that, the more danger there was that a lot of people might believe it. Completely, and that was that was part of it, really, the effect it had, people repeating these claims again and again. And it was quite complex because sometimes they would say things that weren't untrue, but they would be mixed with falsehoods. And that's a lot of how disinformation and fake news works. Often a kernel of truth will be picked up and built on. Um, and part of my job is trying to deconstruct that. Um, when it's come to, for example, the anti-lockdown movement and a lot of the protests that happen, there will be people expressing very um, you know, legitimate concerns, questions, people who are criticising the government or who don't agree with certain policy decisions decisions all you know totally far far away from the realm of online conspiracies but that is then muddled with these extreme conspiracies about global plots and bill gates trying to microchip people with a vaccine and and that sort of stuff and and my job is to navigate that and i think particularly by interviewing people and understanding how those two different camps can interact with each other is an important part of, of what i do
Okay, we're just going to come into our last clip now. It's another panorama you made just a few weeks ago. So just give us a brief background to it and then we'll play the clip. So this is the one I've mentioned a couple of times now into online abuse targeting women. Um, it was um, in part triggered by my own experience of online hate, um, but I investigated whether social media algorithms are pushing hate to trolls. And I spoke to a number of women across public life who have been impacted by hate online. Okay, let's play. The main social media companies all say they don't promote hate on their platforms and take action to stop it. They each have algorithms that offer us content based on things we've posted, liked or watched in the past. Internet researcher Chloe Colliver is helping us run an experiment to test the algorithms. What we're not able to see as researchers, journalists or the public is the way that platforms themselves recommend information to different people. So really some of the only ways to do this are like creating a profile um, and seeing the kind of rabbit hole that it might be led down by the platform itself. So meet Barry. He's not real and neither is this profile picture. We've set up accounts in his name on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, TikTok and YouTube. We switched on all the privacy settings to protect other users and Barry didn't send any abuse but we've designed him to be just like the people who abuse me. He's mainly interested in anti-vax content and conspiracy theories, and also follows some accounts hostile to women. So engaging with that conspiracy content, but also engaging with a little bit of the misogynistic content? Yeah, definitely. I think it's important to capture the misogynistic side of these accounts that you've said have sent you um, that kind of abuse. Right from the start, Barry engaged with content recommended to him by the social media platforms. After two weeks, TikTok hadn't promoted any anti-women content, and not much was suggested by Twitter either. But YouTube had offered some videos hostile to women. And on Facebook and Instagram, Barry was recommended more and more anti-women content, some involving disturbing sexual violence. What I think is really shocking is the extremity of some of this content that's being revealed within just a couple of weeks of quite minimal activity that you've conducted using this account. Far from stopping Barry engaging with anti-women content, Facebook and Instagram appear to have promoted it. There was very little activity that was chosen by you to actually directly search for something. So what that implies is that the platforms themselves have sent this profile the majority of this content themselves and selected it, curated it and targeted it. So actually, this profile, if it were a real person, would have been brought into a hateful community full of misogynistic content very, very quickly within two weeks. Facebook, which also owns Instagram, says it tries not to recommend content that breaks its rules and is improving its technology to find and remove abuse more quickly. YouTube says it has strict policies on hate and quickly removes content that breaks its rules. So you uh, were very much the story there and the amount of online uh, abuse and hatred and venom that's, that's directed to you. How did that feel? Being um, It wasn't always easy, but I think it was really important. And I, it, for me, in some ways, it's... It was, it was a really positive coping mechanism to actually be able to investigate social media to understand um, uh, why I was receiving this hate and why it couldn't be stopped, which was the title of the long read we did that went along with it. Um, and so being able to interview different women about their experiences from Love Island influencers to politicians, but also being able to set up, you know, Barry the Troll. Barry the Troll was based on accounts that sent me abuse, so mainly engaged, as we said, in kind of anti vax and conspiracy content, but also some misogyny. And I should add, I know people found the memes quite funny, but actually a lot of it was way worse than, um, than what we're able to show on the telly, which was actually one of the big barriers when it came to doing this investigation because a lot of the rape threats, death threats, um, some of the content linked to the incel movement, which is a um, very extreme anti women ideology can't be shown at half past seven on BBC One. Um, so you've got to get around trying to visualise this stuff, including what's on social media, for a panorama audience. How do you stay safe? Um, for me, I'm really lucky that I've got brilliant editors and um, security teams at the BBC who can advise me on 
you know, how to keep myself safe online and offline as well. Um, I think particularly for young um, journalists and people getting into this who want to use social media to investigate stuff, which I think is brilliant and they should, totally should do, it's really important to think about how you can keep yourself safe. So making sure your social media profiles are all locked down when you're entering a group. Um, it's important that you don't deceive people so you're clear about who you are, but actually setting up a, you know, a second account where you use your real name and your photo, but you don't have any pictures of your family or your friends is, is a really useful thing to do. Um, also, it's really good, and I think you know when you do have an editor or someone you can turn to and ask for advice, it's good to let them know what you're doing and talk through whether you're entering closed Facebook groups and how you can do that. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm just going to take a quick question at the at the back there, and then uh, sorry, one over there is there. Okay. Uh, I would just wanted to um, ask, like, regarding your role, uh, you're like a special reporter and whatnot, like. How do you go about finding the topics that you want to actually investigate? Do you have like a team that might give you a, something to investigate sometimes or is it all your own like research and whatnot that you do? So um, that's a really good question. Um, a, a lot of it is um, uh, my own reporting. So I will often, um, for instance, there was a story I did before uh, Christmas last year where a picture of a woman's foot had gone viral she was claiming that it was uh, that she'd been injured by the vaccine um, and I wanted to investigate and get to the bottom of it and see what had happened so a lot of it will be you know people emailing me and getting in touch with me and I investigate their stories or I want to understand what's happened I interviewed the son of a conspiracy influencer who told me about the impact that had, had on his life um, but I also do work with a brilliant team at the BBC um, are, which is made up of three different teams that do a combination of fact checking covering disinformation um, I do a lot of the kind of human cost and the real world consequences um, but it's brilliant to have those editors and that team as well to bounce off um, and so it is very collaborative as well as you know often you'll have an idea and then you'll work with them to, to grow that okay we've got questions from over there we've got explosion yeah. of hands going on now so a quick vox pop and then we'll be finishing okay, <laughs> okay um, when it comes to breaking down this information on social media um, the inevitable fact is that it's audience's choice to watch or not to watch your piece do you have any tips or tricks when it comes to raising awareness on the subjects that you care about? I think that it's really good to, and one of the things I like about working at the BBC is you can actually report on the same story in different formats. So you might do it as a podcast or uh, a documentary or a TV news piece or online. And I think it's crucial that you reach different audiences by doing that. Um, and I think that's how you're able to reach more people who might not turn on the telly, but actually might see a report on social media that you've done. Okay, question there. Have you seen an increase in, say, how influencers, individual YouTubers, etc., who cover conspiracy content, say, like Shane Dawson, have really had an effect on the spread of it? You know, someone with one person with millions of followers have more of an effect than, say, a news site that has, you know, a, a, a wide audience as well. Yeah, totally. So um, something we've seen a lot of during the pandemic is how, um, you know, people with really big followings um, are often responsible for spreading a lot of the misinformation online. Um, and um, we see that in, in the way we cover it as well. Actually, Francis Haugen, the whistleblower um, from Facebook, came out and said this, that actually, you know, it's a small number of people that create most of the misinformation online. And I think that's part of how social media sites are learning to tackle it. Sorry, sorry, last question for over there. Sorry. Hello, for, nice yeah. to meet you. I'm Georgia. Um, <laughs> it's cool you talk about student journalism because I run my uni paper. My question is about my dissertation. Oh, go for it. <laughs> um, I'm currently writing it on the incel movement and why it's whack, basically. Do you have any advice about how to avoid burnout and utter despair about the movement? <laughs> yeah, that's <laughs> very good. How do you not get stressed every day? <laughs> that's a very good question. Um, I think for me it's because I feel like it's really important to report on it and that can kind of keep you going um, and actually knowing that you know writing that dissertation or doing the reporting you do you know it exposes important stuff to different people and they can better understand it and that's really good and um, some of the incel stuff is really quite disturbing and not fun to look at um, and it is important as well to you know try and switch off I say this as someone who's very bad at switching off and um, but you know to try and separate as well where you're looking at that if you've got a, an account you can use for for work or for uni and then a separate one that's your personal one to stop them sort of so that you're not getting incel stuff yeah on your normal facebook or instagram that's <laughs> right on that light note um <laughs> sorry uh, sorry sorry for those who uh, um wanted to ask questions but we're out of time i'm afraid you can um, always send me a, a twitter dm or an email and i'm more than happy to talk to you so do you do that if i didn't answer your question please say thank you to marianne Spring. <laughs> <laughs>